I love gladiator games. There's just something about seeing an entire crowd cheer for you as you dodge and swing at your opponent that makes me come back for more. Speaking of which, there was this one game I fondly remember from my younger years that I still find fun even to this day. And that game is Coliseum Road to Freedom. During middle school, I was a pretty big fan of the antiquity, and I often watched documentaries on the History Channel regarding the events that happened during the period. Due to this, I ended up playing all sorts of games based on said period, like Titan Quest, Spartan Total Warrior, and even more obscure titles like Gladius by LucasArts or Fate of Hellas. From all the games I've played, the one that stuck out to me the most was Colosseum Road to Freedom. What made me particularly interested in discussing this old 2005 game 18 years after it was first released was seeing games like We Who Are About to Die gaining a modest success as an indie title. It always bothered me how Colosseum Road to Freedom ended up getting such bad reviews from all sorts of gaming sites back then. But I guess the shortcomings of the game didn't really endear it to the reviewers of days gone by. Still, looking at Mordhau, Chivalry, Exanima, and all sorts of games that focus on a less flashy approach to melee combat, gaining somewhat of a success does make me think that if this game were to come out on PC during perhaps 2020, things could have ended very differently. Instead, what happened in our world is that the game was way more popular in its homeland, Japan. We can see this from Famitsu magazine giving the game generally more favorable reviews. Meanwhile, those of the West tend to be a lot less positive about the game, especially Eurogamer. Perhaps in a way, this combined with not so good sales in the Western market ended up causing the remix version of the game to be only released in Japan. And it was so under the radar on the Western part of the internet that I have only heard of this existing when I was researching for this video. Eventually, the prequel was released on the PSP called Gladiator Begins. I've tried the game before on a friend's PSP. It was decent enough as it is, but I haven't played it extensively to the point where I'll make a video out of it. Perhaps I'll do so in the future. What really saddens me is the latest iteration of the IP called Clan of Champions. Despite my biases, I cannot recommend anyone to buy this game as it is rather poor in quality. Even the supposed sequel of Gladiator Begins, called Gladiox, never came to fruition and I have yet to see any more updates regarding this game. In the end, during the earlier part of my YouTube journey, I still crave for the type of game that gave me the satisfaction that Coliseum Road to Freedom provided me. Although We Who Are About to Die comes to mind, I find that it's a very different experience. Coliseum Road to Freedom is a lot more relaxed in its approach since you don't really have to care about things like equipment, durability and such. Plus the attacks are not physics based, so it's a lot more newcomer friendly. The more realistic art style also made me feel a lot more immersed in the Gladiator experience as well. Still, the game is not without its shortcomings. For example, a mechanic that I'm not a big fan of is how in this game you can avoid being killed off by enemy gladiators if you somehow manage to amuse the crowd enough to the point that they'll spare you from death. This seems like a good mechanic until you remember that this is not a game that autosaves every match or anything. What this mechanic more often than not does is that, when you're fighting a particularly tough enemy like Skull Difficulty Gladiators and you manage to die while giving a decent fight, you now end up losing every piece of equipment you have on your character and have to restart the whole day. It's all fine and dandy if you're the sort of player who likes to go with the flow, but I find this to be a very weird inclusion in a game that allows the player to save and load at will. There's also the routine training that gladiators do when there's no matches in the Atelius Arena or the Colosseum. In this mode, you get to do all types of training, but 90% of the time, you're better off practicing with Decimus, the bald guy, since it increases the level of your limbs which in turn lets your body parts endure more damage and not instantly get KO'd by a single hit from tougher enemies. My lackluster skills in rhythm games ensured that I only picked normal difficulty for this training, however, since messing up does reduce the amount of stat points you get out of this. Meanwhile, as long as you don't miss a single button, you'll get the full amount of stat points per training. Which brings us to Crixus, the cook. In this game, there's five stats. Strength, Dexterity, Agility, Vitality, and Stamina. Strength increases the damage you do. Dexterity ensures that your equipment doesn't get knocked off or stripped. 
Agility increases your movement and attack speed. Vitality increases the amount of damage your limbs can take whilst working in conjunction with body fat levels. And finally, Stamina lets you use more combat abilities or crosscuts. There's also a stat called Capacity which affects the amount of weight your character can move at optimum speed in, which is affected by Strength, Vitality and Stamina. The higher your stat, the more it'll take to increase it, and so on. The thing about Crixus though is that you can only meet him whenever you're not participating in bouts at the Atelius Arena or the Colosseum, which may turn off some players, but in return, you do get stat points from participating in said bouts, so there's that. These two parts of the game ended up getting removed from the prequel, which is understandable, since I can see the unappealing part of the whole process. Personally though, I didn't really mind since I sort of enjoyed seeing the difference in how the trainers end up greeting you as you climb the ranks. That and I find the daily grind to be somewhat immersive for me. Sort of like farming in a game in a way. Agility and dexterity was also removed from the prequel as well. And that's for stats. When it comes to equipment, you basically get the option to loot anything that's on the ground. And you can even send the items to your chest after winning the battle by pressing L1 and X. Things like leg or arm armor can only be looted if you manage to strip them of a gladiator through hitting it enough times, however. The other way to get equipment is to buy them from the merchant that sets up shop at the Atelius Arena. His infantry is randomized and changes every time you visit after a match, and also changes as you go higher up in rank as well. If there's one thing that players may not enjoy about equipment purchasing is that the merchant only has a small selection of merchandise that you can buy at a given time, so if you're looking for a particular weapon or armor, it may take ages until you can get it. The other issue is that this shop is the only place that offers equipment upgrade services that also happens to be randomized in effect as well, when it reaches blue or yellow tier. Probably the one thing I did take issue with when it comes to equipment is the existence of the arena cleaner in a match. This guy is perhaps the most annoying feature I've seen in this game, but his presence is understandable. Since the PS2 can only have so much models in the arena before it starts going haywire, the sheer amount of times that I lost a good piece of equipment that I wanted to loot because of this guy is way too much. To make things worse, he even swipes stat or skill tablets if he happens to decide to do so. Now let's talk about fighting styles. In this game, there exists four of them. Small shield or one-handed style, dual wielding, large shield and finally striker or unarmed. Of all of these, I think after trying all of them, the best style for a newcomer is the small shield or one-handed style. Why? Because this fighting style doesn't have the sorts of weaknesses that all other styles have and it's a lot less stat intensive than others. For example, all you need in order to use skills of this style is to just have a one-handed weapon. And sometimes you don't even need one and helmets can be used too if you're in a pinch. The style is also inherently friendly to newcomers when it comes to equipment as well. If you wish to use heavier armor, you even have the option to just use shields that are insanely light or not even use one to begin with as well, in order to not go past the equipment capacity. Styles like dual wield and large shield on the other hand are a lot more vulnerable to disarms, especially if you're in a duel. And the large shield or second weapon that you have clipped beneath the arena because some guy disarmed you with a devastating strike. The main issue with dual wield is that in-game, you always place your left hand forward. Yet there's not that many good armors for your left hand in this game. That and the fact that you may even be disarmed from someone striking your left hand first is certainly an issue. Still, given its fast strikes and interesting combos, this is an understandable weakness. Large Shield, on the other hand, is a fighting style that suffers the most from being disarmed in my opinion. A small shield or one weapon style tends to have lighter shields by nature, and if a large shield style user is ever disarmed, they probably didn't have that much weight invested in their armor or weapons. A striker, or unarmed style, on the other hand, is a whole different can of worms. The style has no official weapons to speak of, and you are unable to deflect attacks and thus are forced to dodge or just straight up take hits. Technically, you're impossible to disarm with this fighting style, but you hit like a limp noodle and you may end up taking more damage than you'd ever want with this style. It does have other advantages besides being impossible to disarm, however, and that would be 
that unlike other styles, comboing attacks don't take stamina, and you have insanely good active skills as well. That's it for fighting styles, and now we discuss progression. Every time you win a standard match, you earn Palma. After reaching 15 Palma, you become a middle rank gladiator, and reaching 50 turns you into a high class gladiator. If you want to become the highest class or master rank gladiator, you will have to defeat 4 named gladiators that are in the Colosseum. The higher your rank, the more passive skill tablets you can equip and it also increases the maximum difficulty of fights you can enter as well. It also has the unintended consequence of making things that were available to be purchased in lower ranks to no longer be sold by the merchant in the Atelius Arena. Besides gaining rank, there's also the fact that you do have to repay Magirius as he did buy you from a slave trader. Until you repay him with 1 million sesterces, he will always take 80% of your arena earnings. Frankly, the main benefit of repaying him in this game is that this is very much the easiest way to complete a playthrough, so you can unlock more powerful origins like Roman or Greek, and also starting jobs like Gladiator, that increases your strength by 4 points. Besides that, you also get to keep your equipment that you had from a previous playthrough alongside both active skill tablets and stat tablets. Do remember that if you level up a skill, it will have level restrictions, which goes even higher the more you level it, so you will have to level up whatever fighting style that has the active skill you want before being able to use it in a second playthrough. The other benefit of paying your debts to Majerius is that now you can buy slaves. But I do not do this since these slaves do not carry over. If you can afford to buy one to begin with, you'd be better off re-rolling equipment enchantments at the arms merchant anyways. Still, if you insist on getting them, there's the option to buy either female or male slaves. Male slaves are capable of joining you in team fights and animal hunts, while female slaves increase your stats. Now let's talk about audio. Personally, I'm rather biased from the sheer nostalgia, so I can't exactly comment on the OSTs themselves. But what I can tell you is that the game does one thing extremely well that managed to make me fond of the whole gladiator experience. There is something to me that is highly compelling when the audience cheers for you as you'd manage to impress them. Their reactions as you dodge or parry attacks was... exhilarating. I was also really used to how things sound in Colosseum Road to Freedom to the point that I did get a little thrown off by how parry sound like in Gladiator Begins. I think the announcer for the English version of the game was decent, and so is most sound effects in game besides for certain items like non-metal helmets. I think when it comes to graphics, the game is just decent enough. It's not as beautiful as games like Shadow of Colossus, but the colour palette doesn't make me feel like I'm living in the Dung Ages. The violence in this game is also a lot less gory when compared to games like Shadow of Rome, but personally, I didn't mind this. And that's what I can say about the game. I'd rate it 8 out of 10. I'd love to grant the game a higher score, but I do realise that the game does have a share of flaws which many may take issue with. Still, I'd recommend that you try the game, especially if you did watch this video up to this point. That's all I have to say in this video. I hope it was useful, or at the very least amusing, and as always, have a great time.